All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Marty Roth. I'm the Dean of the Barney School of Business. I want to welcome you to the fourth annual Corinne Norgard uh, Women in Leadership Lecture. Uh, this is one of our flagship events every year. Um, and as you can see by looking around the room, it's probably the event that the Barney School hosts which attracts the most diverse audience. Uh, we have students, uh, we have alumni, uh, and we have a number of friends who uh, attend this lecture every year uh, through our partnership with the Entrepreneurial Center and our Wealth Fund here on campus. Uh, this event um, honors the, um, the memory and the legacy of Corinne Norgard, uh, who is a dean here at the Barney School of Business and accomplished many great things during her service. And it always gives us great pride to invite the Norgard family back and to uh, thank them for um, supporting, uh, supporting this event both in person as well as uh, through their um, forward thinking in terms of how to memorialize in a very positive way uh, Corinne's great uh, leadership, uh, leadership and uh, being kind of an early pioneer in um, having a uh, dean role at a business school. So I'd like to thank the Norgards for being here. We have uh, Dick Norgard um, as well as uh, uh, Corinne's son Thor and um, Thor's wife uh, Anna and uh, Karen. It's also great to have you here back again. So um, a warm welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'd also like to recognize two of our uh, distinguished university guests, so uh, President Walter Harrison and Provost Sharon Vasquez. Thank you for being here. Okay. And former President Humphrey uh, Tonkin here as well, so thank you very much for your support. So as I mentioned, this is an event that really focuses on leadership. And you could find lots of different definitions of leadership. You can find definitions from folks like uh, Gandhi and John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Jack Welch, Peter Drucker, people from all walks of life having different visions, having different uh, definitions, having different uh, suggestions on what makes a good leader. And that's one of the great things about this lecture is every year we get to hear another, another viewpoint, another perspective on leadership, which is so important given how quickly our world changes. And I think today we have a great opportunity to he hear some uh, really great insights uh, from Karen Tuzo. Uh, Karen uh, graduated from the Barney School of Business. Um, while she was here, she was a student athlete, captain of the women's basketball team for a few years. Uh, graduated, uh, began her career in human resources, uh, working for IBM. Worked for IBM for about 14 years. Um, exited the workforce uh, to begin a family with her husband, John, who's also an alum of the, uh, of the Barney School. And um, while her children were young, uh, Karen began to do uh, some consulting work, uh, and consulting work for, for some major companies, companies like Aetna, ING, Comcast, uh, and Nationwide. And all of that consulting work was designed to help those organizations develop programs to attract and retain the best workforces to help those organizations drive and, and sustain their companies. Today, uh, Karen is a senior recruiter uh, from a global perspective for Alexion Pharmaceuticals, uh, a global pharmaceutical company that we're fortunate uh, to have located here in uh, Cheshire, Connecticut. So we have somebody here to speak with us who's intimately knowledgeable about human resources. And I think that why we invited Karen and we're so delighted that she was able to accept our invitation is again, if you, you, th you think about leadership, all of us take on some leadership roles within our spheres, whether it's leadership roles in certain aspects of what we do professionally, what we do in our communities, or what we do personally. Um, in each of those areas, there are certain times where we follow, other times where we want to step up and lead. But across all of our backgrounds, one thing that we all need to take leadership of and ownership of is our careers. Nobody's really going to do that for us. So I think it's really great that we have somebody who's going to come and talk to us um, about careers, owning those careers, and doing it from a perspective of leading our own careers in a very, very positive direction. Uh, so with that, 
Uh, please uh, help me in welcoming Karen Tuzo. Thanks. Hello. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Norgard family, Professor Roth, Walter Harrison. I'm excited and delighted to be here. And as uh, Dean Roth just talked about, there are many areas of leadership that we could talk about. And I really contemplated if I have 20 minutes and I have students in the room and I have career people in the room, what could I do that would make you feel in 20 to 30 minutes excited about your career or how you could own your career? So with that, I decided to not talk about a theory of leadership, because I know that you're teaching it here, but more about the concept of our lives and what our journey is going to be. So I'm going to start off. I want to engage you all in this. I want you to be you know, vocal and, and share with me. How many people here, and I want you to stand up, at age five knew that they were going to study business? Anybody? <laughs> no, right? How many at age 10? 15? So now we're 15? Stand up. Don't be shy. Come on. OK. What else, what else were people thinking at age 15 that they were going to study or, or be engaged you know, in their career? Anybody? Did you know at 15? Doctor. doctor. Did you become a doctor? No. no. OK. Anybody else? Psychology. Psychology. Are you a psychologist? No. no. Teacher? You're a teacher. Good. At 15? You knew that. At five. All right. You didn't stand up. So you can sit down. Thank you. So the reason I asked that question, how many people here are under age 22? So we got our little crowd back there. All right. So, and everybody else is over age 22, right? <laughs> the rest of us. So the reason I, I started with that is because really your career is like a journey. And I want you to take this 20, 25 minutes that we spend together and think about your own journey. It's your time. Think about your life's journey and think about your career journey. So let's see. Has anybody ever heard of that? All right, good. So we are going to learn something today. So 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. Really what that means is your life is going to be filled with them. You will find many things in your life that bring you joy. You will also hit some very hard times, I'm sure. Every one of you will hit something in your life that makes it difficult. And what really defines who you are and how successful you will be is how you handle those difficult times in life those joys and those sorrows. And your career is really no different than that. I have been through a very interesting journey on my career. As I said, I left off that first job where I started in the World Trade Center. I graduated from the University of Hartford January 1st, 2nd. I was working at the World Trade Center January 14th. It was a two-hour commute from Long Island. I knew that was not what I wanted to do the rest of my life, but I loved finance and Wall Street, so it was, it was a very fun start. I then switched to IBM, which was very close, and I ironically started in administration, went to finance, went into sales, and eventually into human resources as I did recruiting. So I have had this incredible journey in my own career, and as, as Professor Roth said, I did make some choices. I made choices when I had children. I made choices throughout my career that, that made sense for me and my family. So as you sit here today, and you noted at age 15, there were still very few people who knew what they wanted to be or what they wanted to do. And I think all the students that are here are going to realize that even though you chose business as a career, you will have many different opportunities in the business world, as I did. And you should embrace those opportunities and engage yourself in whatever it is that you're doing. So enjoy the journey. This is a scary one. 30 years. I think in the last 30 years, in my 30 years since I graduated here, the world has changed more than it, than it probably ever will for the next generation. I think we all know why. It's a global workforce. Why? You will no longer have job security. That's a hard one to hear. 
right? Our parents, our grandparents went to work for companies for 30 years. They got pensions and that was their life. Your life will be very different. And that's a good thing because you have to embrace that. The technology revolution has been amazing in terms of your business career. The internet, laptops, cell phones, social media, LinkedIn, all of these things give you an opportunity to expand your career, but also makes it more challenging and more stressful. So you have to, again, embrace the journey. All right, so this is the fun slide. I thought I would bring a couple pictures from the archives here from 30 years ago. So get ready. This is me in 1982. Now, I also met my husband here the third day on campus. So I, the University of Hartford not only changed my business career, but I met, I met and married a, a gentleman I'm still married to 28 years later. <laughs> Look at that hair. How about that? That is two months after we met. I think we were getting ready to have Thanksgiving for the first time. And here we are today. So less hair. That is definitely a theme. But he's still a good guy. And one of the things I'll tell you later is that you do learn in recruiting that you can judge the character of a person in an interview. I can certainly in the first 15 minutes that I meet someone. You can really tell a sense. And I got that in the first 15 minutes with my husband, so I kept him. All right, another archive photo. More hair on the right here. So when I was playing here, my husband was really the star athlete. I, I really wasn't the star athlete. My sister played here four years. But did you ever go to the gym and you see all the photos, all the, the plaques? So of course, being the college student, I said, do my hair for that picture. So that's me in the middle with all that hair because I didn't want that to be up there for umpteen years and not have the, uh, not have the hair done. So 30 years ago, right? So let's talk about your career journey. Wherever you are, whether you're early in your career, the midpoint of your career, considering a career change, as many of us do in, in, in mid, midlife, if you want to call it that, this still is very important to note. There is no elevator to success. You must take the stairs. Anybody disagree with that? No. It's what you put into something. It's what you're going to get out of it. My son did the uh, animation, so we'll see how good this is. <laughs> He's 14, he took it over last night. So some key elements to your success. I am a corporate recruiter. Um, I have done it since my children were born, primarily because I do love people, and I love to match people with successful opportunities, and I just think it's, it's fun to watch people's career go, grow. But there are some key elements to your success, students, athletes, whomever you are, and these, these don't change in whatever you do. Apply your work ethic and have some ambition. Um, I don't hire lazy people. It's just that simple. So I'm looking for you to invest yourself in my company or wherever I'm hiring you for. And I'm sure all the people that own businesses and do that would say the same thing. I think the second line is probably the thing I believe the most in. And that's your attitude, what you bring to work. Because again, in human resources, you could be the smartest person in the world and bring incredible skills. But if you have a negative attitude, nobody wants to be around you. And nobody will keep you. So remember that in life. Your attitude is everything. Determination, persistence, vision, these are all things I also learned playing basketball. I played basketball since second grade. It's a great team sport. You learn when to pass, when to shoot, when to give for your team. You just, these are just key elements of, of you know, things that are important for, for the workforce. Luck and timing. Anybody know why they're listed separate? Exactly. You cannot control your luck and your timing, but you can control those others. So when we coach basketball, my husband and I, we tell the kids, you can control the effort you give on the court 
but you cannot, you know, that is something you can control. Some of the other things you can't control. So you students sitting here today, you're gonna get in the business world. Every one of you is gonna have a different journey in your business career. The person sitting next to you may just get lucky. Somebody may call them up for an opportunity that's incredible, and they may rise to the top. Somebody just may, timing, may get themselves in a, certain, in a certain place. So what I tell you in your business career, but also just in life, control what you can control. These are out of your control. So just control those and, and have fun with it, and we'll see what happens. So these are some key messages that I put in red, um, and that's at the bottom. But remember, on your journey, these are, some, these are some things that are important. Whether you're, again, early career, mid-career, define your goals, stick to them, be a leader with a vision, let go of what does not work. You hear this all the time at work. Someone has something to say, somebody doesn't agree with it, and someone just keeps going on and on. Let go of what doesn't work. Don't be afraid to fail. Much easier said than done, right? We hear that all the time in the business world. Take risks. But, you know, it isn't, it isn't easy to fail, and it's not fun to fail. So it isn't easy to just take those risks. But every once in a while, you're going to have to try to take those risks to see if you can get it done. Passion. Remember I said attitude was key? Passion is so important in your career, your business career. If you do not like what you're doing, it won't matter much. You're going, you're showing up. So you really need to find a career that you are passionate about, that you get up every day, right? Wh who said it before? Somebody said it. You never work a day in your life if you love what you do, right? So get up and love it. So when my husband was here and he got drafted by the New York Mets, I was like, go for it. How many people get an opportunity to play for the Mets? So I went back home to work. We weren't engaged yet. So he went and he, he played with the New York Mets down in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, he came back in the draft. And it was very, very hard. Uh, you know, three years in, he knew that he probably he was with the Mets organization when they won the World Series in 86. They weren't moving people up. And he knew he would struggle with that. And then he blew out his arm, so it made the decision a little easier. <laughs> But the reality was, here he had come out of the University of Hartford with a management degree. He was the only one in his family to get a degree. His parents came here from Italy. There was no money, sixth grade education. John worked as hard as anyone. The University of Hartford, he's still so indebted to the university for giving him the opportunity. And when he got that opportunity to go after what he was passionate about, I totally supported him. And he's still, you know, very passionate in his business career, but it's, 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 if you find yourself in an opportunity to get something that you love and you're passionate about, go for it. I think that's one of the messages I want to say, especially when you're young. Take some risks. Try it. Continuous learning. Obviously, I'm, we're here at the University of Hartford, but also in your career. Constantly learn. The world constantly evolves and changes. So continuous learning, whether it's coming to a lecture, networking, whatever you need to do to keep your skills up, very, very important. Network and LinkedIn. How many people are in LinkedIn? Everybody? It's where it's at. That's how I find everybody. That's, that's the groups, the, 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 the webinars. That's, that's where you need to be. And then, of course, that's, that's just the positive energy in me. If you've got something in you that's holding you back, let it go. Go do whatever you need to go and let it go. Life is too short to focus on negative things. I see Walter Harrison nodding his head. Do you agree? Yes. Is life is too short. If you are negative, if someone brings you down in your life, I'm going to give you the permission to shed them. <laughs> you figure this out when you hit 40, but I'm giving you this information now in your 20s. If someone is bringing you down, you either tell them it's time to go or you move on. You surround yourself with positive people who will bring you up. That's the way to go in life. And in the business world, it's the only way to succeed. Just a, just a quote, again, really impressive leaders that say, you know, amazing opportunity. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've done this actually a couple times. I was not a finance major here. I was a marketing major. I was at IBM. 
I was uh, doing some administrative work early in my career, and an, an opportunity opened up in finance. Now, I am actually very good with numbers, but I did not have a finance degree. I did not have a master's in finance. But I said, I can do that. And they're like, OK. So I got an opportunity, and I went into finance, and it shaped the next eight years of my career. So sometimes you just, you just have to you know, believe in yourself and decide that, you know, I was educated. I had gone to finance one. I passed all my accounting classes. I just wasn't, you know, wasn't an MBA in finance. So try to figure things out. Sometimes, you know, good advice like this will take you a long way. Now this is, uh, this is my version of what employers are seeking in 2015 and beyond. On the left, you'll see very much the soft skills, and on the right, the technical. Why did I put the why did I put the the soft skills on the left? Well, that too, but actually, actually, to be honest with you, we can teach this, and you can learn this in school. I can't always teach that. So employers definitely are seeking the soft skills as heavily as the technical skills. So with the students that I just met before here in the round table, we talked about how to present your resume, how to look at internships, and then you know what would get me in. So the resume is your ticket for entry. It's all those things on the left that make your career go and make you survive in corporate America, right? Uh, being organized, communicating effectively across the organization, processing information, being a leader, standing up when a leader is needed. These are things you're going to learn in college, learn in your MBA program, learn in other things, very important as well. But as the world becomes way more educated and everybody's coming out with a college degree, the MBA now is, is more of the entry ticket, right? Or the higher degree programs are more of the entry ticket. So you need to have that, without a doubt. But those are really important. And I keep highlighting in red, and uh, quiz you later, but communication. Obviously, communication is so critical in our global world today. And here it is again. I, I, I find these quotes on LinkedIn. <laughs> see, so I'm in LinkedIn, and I see them, and I go, oh, these are good. And I save them to my pictures. And I think, when, when can I share them? You know, and this is a good opportunity for me to reinstate. So your academic credentials, obviously, again, the entrance point gets you there. You need the degree, right? You're here, your students, or you've got your degrees. Then you get into the work world, and your communication skills become critical for your success. So if you need to work on those soft skills, that's an important part. So I don't know how many people like to interview. It's not always the, the fun thing to do. Um, I do it all day long. I have more stories I could tell you than you wouldn't believe what people do in an interview or not do in an interview. But these are just some things. And it's true that I really do make up my mind in the first 15 minutes. I put 10 there, but I'll give you 15. What, when I don't feel it with somebody, it's rare that I'm going to turn it. But if I feel it, then it keeps going, and it just keeps getting better. And I'm always amazed at what people will do in an interview. Um, but for one example, I was telling the students before, I had a gentleman in from General Electric, very professional company, I don't know, maybe a month and a half ago for a, for a uh, long range planning finance role, Jeff's role. And he was in the lobby, and he had his phone on. And I came out to greet him, and I shook his hand, and he still had his phone on, and he was doing one of these as we walked to the interview slot. And I went, nope. Super educated kid, and I said, "Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, it just didn't work out in the end. Why? What's the most important thing I've told you already? First of all, I mean, attitude, communication. But he was not engaged. He was. He didn't even seem like he was interested. Why are you wasting my time? So don't. You know, don't. These things are so critical. 
Um, I had an administrative assistant come in about two weeks ago. She was scheduled for an 8.30 interview. So I live, my office is in the way back of the building. So I decided at 8.25 I would start the trek up because he usually calls me. And my security guy and I are in link, right? If somebody is late or they're negative or something happens when they come in, he lets me know. It's, it's a little trick we have. So anyway, 8.30, I make my way all the way to the front. She comes highly recommended from somebody, and she is not there at 8.30. So I'm like, all right, maybe she got stuck. It was a snowy day. Maybe she got stuck, but what do you do first thing? You call. So I said to Paul, did you get a call? So, no, no. I said, all right, well, I'm going to go get a cup of tea. And I went and got a cup of tea, and I came back. It was 8.37. She wasn't there. So I said, OK. She got there right after I came back. I went out. And uh, I went in to meet her. And I said to her, so I gave her the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she called, and I didn't get it, right? It's on my voicemail. I said, did you, did you miss the building? What happened? Like, everything OK? If she had said, I missed the building, I drove by, I'm so sorry, I, I don't know what happened, I would have softened up. She said, I was here on time. There was a line at the desk. And I said, oh. And she lost me within not even two minutes. So, you know, she basically lied because my security guard was right there. And so my message there is tell the truth, but be sincere. You know, be honest. People do get lost. Something happens. We're not going to completely penalize you. But, you know, when she said that, I'm surprised she didn't pick up on it. I, I made that the shortest interview of my life. But these are, these are the important things. You know, making eye contact, listening well and showing sincerity. Do your homework. You know, I had a gentleman come in. He drew me a picture of our drug is Solaris. It's in a vial. It's an infusion drug, a very expensive drug. He gave me a presentation with pill capsules on the front. I'm like, did you even look at our website? Did you even know how our drug was, was you know, put into patients? Things like that. That's knowing the, the sincerity for the role and the company is very important. Um, obviously, I know all the students know this, but I'm going to reemphasize it. You have a great career services group here, and they do a really good job, as most of the colleges do, on what never ever to do, right? Never be late, never underdress, never check your phone. So social media, I, I don't check it on everybody, but I do check it on occasion. So I think we, we don't have to say a lot about that. We all know what's appropriate on social media and what's not appropriate on social media. Your first impression is critical. So if your social media is not looking you know, positive and professional in the business world, it's going to impact you. So, so take it seriously when you're ready to get that internship or that first job. So this goes back to what we talked about before, employers. Um, this is a big one for me. I would rather hire somebody I know that I know their character are than hire somebody I don't know um, that may be equally skilled. Does anybody feel the same way? Why? I mean, if you invest in someone, you want to know that they have a strong character and, that, again, what they're made of and what they'll do for your company. So. I don't know that every company follows that philosophy, but it's something I definitely I feel is important moving forward. There's my son with those fun <laughs> graphics. I, uh, I gave him free reign last night. I didn't know what was coming out. So these are just, again, more fun things to think about. You know, your first impressions, your personality is your business card how you leave others. So we have a big thing at Alexion, and, and I've done it in all my talent acquisition. It's called candidate experience, right? So if someone comes in and interviews with me and they don't get the job, I still treat them very respectfully. They will leave with a positive impression of the company and know that, um, you know, that it, it, it was a, a good experience because it's really important on both ends to show that respect. But you never know when someone will come back and remember you or have something later or network or, or refer you to someone else in your career. So always try to leave 
any you know business professional meeting greeting networking with who you really are as a person i think if people know who you are as a person and your character then you'll end up in the right spot and be successful in your career So I wanted to leave time for questions. So I think we're right about the 20 minutes when we finish up here. But this is just really a summary of what we've talked about. 20 minutes is, is a very fast time to, to sort of talk about the things that are important in your career. But having a passion, being that positive team player that everybody wants to hire, work hard, create something for yourself. I think this one is really important to me. Treat everyone with respect and be kind to others. I don't you know, know how everybody feels here, but I don't think there's any real need to take people down in your business career. I have never done it. Um, I don't think you need to be that kind of a person and be successful. It will always come back to bite you. So regardless of who you are in the organization, whether you're the CEO down to the administrative assistant, you know, I treat everyone with respect. And I'm, and I'm kind. If someone's having a bad day and they bark at me, you know, every once in a while, I'll sit back, you know, are you having a bad day? You know, so, you know, look around this room. You're, you're all here for a reason and you're all here to help each other. And if you, if you just, everybody was kinder, the world would be a better place. So I, I really do believe in that. Um, you know, sometimes people will tell you, you got to be ruthless in business. Maybe, maybe. I've done okay being kind. I, I've done okay working hard. I've done okay you know, uh, with those characters, you know, things that are important to me. So be passionate and be who you are. That's the other thing I tell people, when you interview or when you're going for something, be who you really are. Because if you really are who you are and someone doesn't hire you, it's probably better off. It's probably not the right fit, right? So that doesn't mean, you know, get crazy and just, you know, but be who you are, show yourself in the interview. I sort of disarm people in the first 10 minutes so I can see who they really are. Because I have to, they have to fit, right? I brought them in, they have the skill, so now I have to see if they're gonna fit. Their personality is gonna fit. And how are they gonna you know, fit into my culture and, and this company, and are they willing to do? So you know, be, your, be your own self. And I do live by this mantra every day. My house is pathetic. My husband, Jim Keener, my husband has more quotes and we follow more mantras in our house. But I do tell my kids that I do my best every day and that has to be enough. Because this world is stressful. And your world will be stressful with global workforce that you never had, you know, 30 years ago. We didn't have that. It's going to be stressful. So instead of getting stressed, I do yoga every Saturday as well. But I say, I do my best every day. I tell my kids, that has to be enough. So whatever you're doing, do your best. If, if you get a C on that report, I'm not being thrilled, but if you tell me that's the best you can do and you did your best, all right. But let's try, you know, everything you do has to have a goal around it, right? So every, everything you're trying to achieve, whether it's your life journey or your career journey, you have a goal. So if you do your best, that should be good enough. And then look to your network for support. People can help. You know, don't be afraid to ask for help. So that truly is my mantra. I live by that so that I can, I can live life in a joyful, happy place. Because the company that I'm at now is fantastic, but it's very, very fast paced and high pressure. And, and the way I survive is just go in every day and do my best. So pick your own mantra, whatever it may be, whatever you're happiest with, you're comfortable with, and live by it. Because in red, I really do believe that if you believe that you're worthy and you deserve those opportunities, then they will, they will happen for you. And you'll be successful in whatever you do. But it has to start right here, right? So that's why I picked It's Your Career, Own It. Because in the old days, you got a job, the old days, my parents age, in age, and you worked there for 30 years. How many people here have worked at a job for more than 10? Okay, good amount, 20, couple, right? Probably more like five to eight, many. So the point is you're gonna have a lot of different things happen in your career and it's your journey. It's your journey, it's your journey. It's not someone else's journey, it's your journey. So embrace it. 
So let's see what I have at the end here. So truthfully, this, this is the thing I want to leave with you the most. When I see this, I really, I do believe this. I, I really don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Did you know that terrorism was going to be a, a part of our lives? I mean, I worked in the World Trade Center. I lost nine from my high school, from 9-11. I went to a, a high school that was a huge Wall Street high school. If you had told me that was going to happen, and I wasn't working there at the time, but lost nine from my high school, I would have said, that's a completely different world than, than we ever had. So you don't know what tomorrow will bring. But if you just, again, do your best, hold your head high, think positive, expect the best. I think that life can be, you know, your career, your journey, your life's journey will be positive. So my son, the one that I told you animated this, my friend Kelly is here. She knows my children. Um, we've shamelessly put him up here. You'll see. Animated by Kyle Tuzo, who is 14, is the future Who player here. That's him last week at Corpus Christi School in Wethersfield. And there he is, 24. He decided to add that in, and I, I said I'd, I'd let him. I'd let him. I'd let him have that. So really, um, I think. You know, I really appreciate the opportunity. You know, it's a short amount of time to give you, again, I didn't want to go into leadership theories. I didn't want to touch things that you could probably study at the university and get. I really wanted to touch you in 20 minutes to say, what is my journey going to be? And how am I going to impact it the most? And what am I going to do for my own journey? And how am I going to make decisions for my own career? So I chose to stay in recruiting. I chose that great consulting assignments. I was raising a family, and I wanted balance in my life. I didn't want my IBM career, which was 60, 70 hours a week, which I did for 14 years. And that's OK. And now I'm back, because that little guy is 14. And I'm back full time for about two years now at Alexion. It's a great company, great pace. You know, it just it's, it's perfect. Next part of my career. I don't know, I tell you one thing, I'm going warmer weather though. <laughs> I am going down south. I am tired of this cold. But if I can leave you with that thought before any questions, that's what I really wanted to leave you with, was that you're all here for a reason. I thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm definitely excited about all the students and where your business career can take you. The University of Hartford is a great place. It provides a great opportunity for you to launch your career. And um, thank you for coming. Uh, no, I don't, and I'm definitely pro-woman, certainly, uh, because women get it done, and I tell people that. If you need something done, go to the woman who's the busiest person in your life and give it to her, and she'll get it done. But I don't mean that any negativity to men, because I hire a lot of men, obviously. So I think um, I look at a blank slate. Skills, requirements get you that initial look. I don't care what gender you are. And then the rest all happens from there. But I think, you know, diversity is a great topic because, you know, the Norgard family, obviously Corinne was a leader in what she did because she did it before a lot of other women did it. And I think we all have to support each other. This is what I tell women, support each other. Support each other in, in, your, in your success, you know, in your rise. Because uh, raising children and having a top career is hard. I think the topic, you know, this is not a political statement, but when Michelle Obama came out and said it's hard 
to do it. Let's just talk about it. I respected that. Again, not a political statement, but I thought it was great that she said, it's hard to be a top lawyer and raise children and do this and support your husband. I think the point I like to say is just be supportive. Uh, but if a woman tells me I'm coming back to work or I'm in work, I don't question it at all because I'm expecting that they're telling me the truth of what they want to do. So if you're qualified, you know, we're going to keep that conversation going. But I think women need to be really supportive of women. I, I think the whole concept of saying that you're going to go through your whole life's journey and your whole career journey without changing a little, ebbs and flows, may not work for every woman. Some do. Some go 30 years and that's what they do. You know, so I'm just, that's how I really feel about the concept of women in the work. I think it's, um, I stepped down. I, I literally walked away from a huge career. I, it took us five years to get my older son. I mean, we were adopted. So we had, a, we had some, one of those joys and sorrows, you know, where it was tough. And um, I made a choice. And I look back now, they're 18 and 14, and I am so glad I did what I did. That's, that was my choice, right? So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I don't, I don't look at women any different. If the job says I need seven years of, you know, experience in this and a, and a bachelor's in this and, you know, an MBA, and you've got it, then that's great. You know, I'm going to, you know, may, depends, you know, depends on the group and the organization. But diversity is such an important topic today. And, you know, we keep, we keep talking about it, and I think it's important that we do. Yeah. Yes, question? Yeah. They see this job that looks awesome. Yeah. They're not a perfect match. Right. But clearly, unless they get an interview, they will go nowhere in this opportunity. What advice do you give the job seeker to pique the interest of the recruiter? Write the best cover letter of your life. Nobody writes them anymore. I get hundreds of resumes. I go, where's the people telling me, you know, why they want this job? They hit LinkedIn and they apply to 50 jobs. I don't know and then network. Find me if it's me. I'm really good at that, but I've been doing this a long time. So find who has the job. Find somebody who knows that person who has the job. And then your character, right? So find somebody who knows somebody and then call them up and say, I really am interested in that job. I, I see you're linked into that person or you know that person. Would you mind putting in a word for me or sending all my information? It's really how it happens. You probably won't get that look with 100 resumes on the table. That's reality, right? I said I wasn't going to come here and tell you not reality-based. It is the way the world works. So network, cover letters are gone. I don't know what happened. I need to talk to career services. Tell me why you have what I need. Because you also know what I learned in a cover letter? I learn about you personally. I learn how you write, because somebody could have written your resume. I, I, I really learn like how are you talking to me, and I might get excited about you. So when someone sends me a resume and there's a cover letter, I read it every time. And I tell people, you may not get the job, but it's still you're going to you're going to get a look. But the network, it's so tied to the network. You got to just use it. You know, young. What if there's a typo? Oh, garbage. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sorry. If you cannot put if you cannot spell check your resume. I did college recruiting for Aetna. Right? Hired hundreds of students. I would stand out at the career fairs here, UConn, all the schools, and the way that someone presented themselves to me was great. And you know, if I looked at their resume, it was a typo. It's just, it's just, I'm sorry. You're not going to tell them that, but that's what you do. It's that important that you do not have errors on your resume. Yeah, it's basic 101, right? Anybody else? In the back? Yeah. Hello, Mark Moore. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Um, so communication to me shows a lot of leadership. Uh, I like somebody who's shown perseverance a lot. So if somebody gives me a little bit of their story and they've persevered through something difficult in their life, to be honest with you, I, I kind of like that because that's that joys and sorrow thing that I started with. If I feel like you can get through tough things, because the business world isn't easy all the time, 
I like that. So that's a leadership to me that says I persevered, I'm determined, I got through. Um, so that's big for me. Everybody's different, but that's really important for me. So I will venture off into the interview and I will always ask somebody, so where were you raised and born? And then they start to tell their story. And then somebody will tell me, you know, I didn't get, to, you know, I had to work my way through college and I had, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't get everything handed to me and, and those, and so then I think, oh, you've done this on your own. You've shown that you're a leader. So if I shift gears on you and your job six months down, you're not gonna be like, hey, that wasn't in the job description. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna persevere. So, so communication is a huge leadership trait, which is why I emphasized it so heavily. Um, perseverance and determination. I didn't grow up with a lot. I actually had to graduate from the university uh, a semester early because my father could not afford my senior year. I was here at the university my junior year. As you know, I met my husband here. My husband had no, no money. His family came from Italy. My grandmother came on the boat from Ireland. And I got here, and my sister was here. So it was half price for me to come here. So my father finally said, go to the University of Hartford. You love it up there. I said, OK. And then he went home that summer, and he said, guess what? We can't afford your senior year. I went, oh my god. So I said, what do I do? So my husband lent me his car. This is a true story. He took his bike back to Torrington and went to work. And I borrowed his car for eight weeks and took 18 credits in eight weeks over the summer and graduated that January and went to work for Dean Witter January 14th. Now, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but what I'm saying is I persevered. I had no help. Neither one of my parents went to college. Um, nobody guiding me, and I just did it on my own. So these are the kinds of kids I look for on the teams that I, that I recruit for, or if I'm coaching. I'll pick the kid who's diving on the floor working harder than I will the one that's scoring all the points all the time. You want, you want a little bit of everybody. So there's a lot of leadership things like that that I look for, but perseverance, determination, communication, really critical. You're welcome. You had a question. Yeah. Ah. You know, versus, you know, I scan the um, resumes, I had a few phone interviews, and there you go. I am really good at that because I've been doing it a long time. So when I got to Alexion, they, you know, we see three candidates for every role at the end. So we do a lot of phone screens up front. We see three. I already know who I want pretty much in, in it. So I can influence it by, you know, um, bringing a round table together and discussing the skill sets that the candidate has versus, we just did it this morning before I came here. We hired a senior manager for global mobility. That's an individual who, uh, who does expats for global assignments. And we had two candidates, one that did it externally, right, client services, and the one that did it internally. We were split down the middle. And I knew we needed the one that was internal for a lot of reasons. So I let the conversation play and go back and go, and then I finally said, don't you think this is what we need more? And then they all started nodding their head. So I'm a, an effective HR person, but I've also been a business person. That's why. Remember, I didn't come the traditional HR path. So I got into it after. So I really know the roles, and that's, I think, why I'm effective. But not every HR person cares or is effective at that. They may just be the gatekeeper, and then they pass it along. So you got, you got, got to get through a few people <laughs> before you really get hired. Um, but I just, I just know, and it's just fun for me because they, they always say, "How do you know?" And I say, "It's just been doing it a long time." And you know, you just know who's a better fit. And again, all those other things, communication. You know, this this particular woman, she happened to be very tall, so she was a hoop player. That didn't hurt, right? <laughs> and uh, that definitely didn't hurt. And she had this great personality and energy. Like you wanted to be around her. And so I said, "Look, we've got two great candidates here, but..." She really is just, she's passionate about what she does. And so, you know, and then they were like, yeah, you're right, you're right, she'll fit great. So that's how we do it. It's, it's just a science of, you know, and then knowing your hiring managers too. Sometimes they want you to own it a little, like they, then they can, but most of the time I say, you own it. I'm supporting the process. You own it, right? It's your hire, but I still support the process. So if you want me to make the decision, I will. But you're gonna have to be the one training them Right? You, you live with them every day. I get to go back to my office. So I just have fun with them. Again, you know, I've been doing it for a really long time. So it's fun. Yes, in the back. 
Hi. Hi, Lauren. They determine it? We both determine that. Because usually they determine it, right? They'll call you and say, you know, we've hired someone else, and you may not be the right cultural fit. I, you know, there's no really easy answer here. All I can tell you is you can go on a lot of interviews, and you kind of know it. Do you ever know when you walk out and you go, hmm, that felt really good, or hmm, not so good? And it's reading, the, it's reading the dynamics of the group, or if it's an individual, it's reading the dynamics of that individual. I, I recently um, went for an interview about, I don't know, about six months ago to, to an insurance company here, Connecticut, because my son is going to be going to East Catholic, and I'm thinking at some point I might have to come back to the Hartford area. And I met with the VP of HR, and I said, I've got this, I, I, I'm, I'm good for the next round. Then I met with the next round, and I walked out, and I called my husband, I said, I won't get this job. He goes, how do you know? I go, because I'm not a cultural fit. He goes, how do you know? I said, because they kept asking me questions about my energy, and could I handle, you know, um, uh, working with a global company that couldn't change policies fast enough. So they, they knew that I was somebody who liked things to happen and could change, and yet, they weren't that type of company. It was a smaller company. So it's okay, right? So, you know, it's very hard. I think the best I can tell you is keep your head up, keep interviewing, because when you know you got it, you're going to feel great when you go to work every day. And if you didn't, don't take it as a reflection that you weren't qualified. Just say, well, that wasn't the one for me. Because it is, it is no, there is no rocket science to cultural fit, but it's types of companies. Like when I went to IBM, uh, from Dean Witter, Wall Street, to IBM, I really liked the culture of IBM. It was fast, it was engaging, it was, it was growth, and so that's why I stayed as long as I did. I fit, right? Um, you'll find it. Keep your head up. All right. It's hard. It's really hard. Um, do you give um, honest and candid feedback to candidates that are not selected? <laughs> <laughs> not always. Okay. You know, why do you think we can't? Legally. We graduated way too many lawyers in the last 30 years. We legally can't say, but, and I get constant emails follow up, well, why, why didn't you select me? And I always have to say, unfortunately, we found somebody else who was a better cultural fit. You had the skills. So no, we can't always give you that answer because legally someone might say, well, you didn't hire me because I'm a woman or you didn't hire me because of this. And I'm going to go, but I brought you in for an interview. So you were a good fit, but there's three or four people here. So no, I can't always do that. But if you're a friend, I'll definitely tell you. Or someone I know, I'll be very honest why you didn't get something. But yeah, the legal world has changed. <laughs> it's changed it for us, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Love her. <laughs> yes. I'm only 5'8, but. Yep.
Yeah. So it's, you know, yeah. Really, how do you see this? Because, you know, a lot of us, people just don't even do it all. Yeah. Well, like I've already told you how I feel about that. I think women can do it all. If you, if you want to try to do it all and work 100 hours a week, and something, something falls down in, in trying to do it all as women. I mean, that's just a reality. So I think women have tremendous opportunity. They're over 50% of the workforce, without a doubt, now. The stats are, are there. They're reaching new heights in, in every area. Uh, business, I think, is a challenge to be honest with you, because I don't think we've accepted balance so much in the workforce. And there are points where women need balance. So the, the minority, it makes it more difficult, right? So when I told you I didn't know at 15, when I was 10, I wanted to be a juror. A juror, a juror because I thought I would solve problems and put the bad guys away. My parents had to tell me that that was not a paid job. <laughs> so at 15, I want to be a nurse, okay? And then I jumped off of a thing and cut my toe and it was hanging off and I didn't do very well with that. <laughs> so I totally shifted my career at 17 to go into business and I thought I would run a company because I, I just had drive. So I think, I do believe women can do anything they absolutely want to do. I just think the workforce for business is still challenging with that. So good for Corinne because it isn't easy. It isn't easy. I mean, I, I could say up in here, you know, if you do all the things I say you do, you still can be very successful. It's just how many women CEOs do we have? Very few in business, right? How many women in, in the boardroom? So my best friend that I went to high school with worked for Solomon Brothers. She was the only woman Remember I told you I worked in the World Trade Center? She worked for Solomon Brothers. I worked for Dean Witter. She was in the first bombing. She was the only woman in the room when that first van went up and all the smoke. She was on the top floor with all men. She was the only woman. And she was nine months pregnant, or eight months pregnant. And when they announced that they had to get out, she said, everybody took off. And they said, you go to, the, you go to the, the, the top of the building and we'll, we'll get a helicopter to get it. She was like me, an athlete. And she said, no, I'm going to go down the stairs with the rest of you. Like eight and a half months pregnant. Lindsay is a senior. Her daughter that was in is a senior at Trinity College right now. So I know that you can look back at the dates. But anyway, she was the only woman in the room. And she made it all the way downstairs. She was on national news, all covered in smoke and crazy stuff. She gave up her career after her fourth child and just returned a few years ago into a really nice career. But after her second child came, she said, I don't think I can keep that up, that same pace. So it's harder. I think it's harder. It's just, that's just my personal opinion. But I still believe that you should really support women and women should definitely help each other get to the top if that's what you want. So it's just, you know, I don't know that business has completely gotten there yet, to be honest. Anybody else? Are we running out of time? Anybody else? Wow, you guys asked some really good questions. I can't uh, thank you enough for, for asking those great questions and for being with me here tonight. I really appreciate that, the Norgood family. Thank you. Thank you for Corinne for being tall and smart and all those good things. And thank Professor you. Roth, thank you. <laughs> Well, you can stay up here a second. Oh, okay. well, uh, Karen, that was great. Thank you very much. Uh, great uh, words of wisdom based on your experience and um, all the uh, great work that uh, you've done professionally as well as all your um, kind of personal and um, community accomplishments, I think, um, shed light on uh, a number of different facets of leadership. So really appreciate that. And one of the things that I uh, uh, really enjoyed about your presentation, um, a lot of different themes came out that were beneficial not only for our students, but for people that are working or aspire to work in a lot of different types of business contexts, whether it's large organizations or small ones, lots of different themes came up about um, the role of um, leadership for, uh, for women. And I think that really played out very well because this particular event, uh, while we kind of organize it in the Barney School, it's kind of co-hosted by our 
Entrepreneurial Center as well as the uh, Wealth Fund here at the University of Hartford. So I think you really struck on chords that uh, resonated very well with um, just about everybody here in the audience. So on behalf of everybody, a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite everybody to join us for a reception in, on the Rotunda at the 1877 Club. So if you are um, new to the, uh, to the university, just follow the crowd um, and we can take the inside path uh, so you don't have to uh, uh, deal with the frigid temperatures outside. But please join us there. <laughs>